Hello and welcome to our Travel Tuesday series. Today we're going to be focusing on Iceland and the Northern Lights. Uh, if you would like to, please feel free to uh, tell us in the chat function at the bottom of the screen uh, your name and where you're joining us from. Uh, hello, hello Chicago. Oh, we have some folks joining us from Ohio. Good to see you. Thank you for coming. Got Mary joining us from the Bronx. Hi, Mary. Oh, it looks like we have some folks joining us from Canada. Welcome. Oh, looks like a lot of folks are joining us from Florida. Thank you for joining us. Donna, welcome. Hi, Shirley. Thank you for joining us. Got Debbie joining us from Pennsylvania. Ah, folks from Montana. Welcome. Hello to the folks joining us on Facebook. If you are joining us on Facebook, if you'd like to tell us where you're joining from, you can put that in the uh, uh, in the comment section. Also, if you have questions, you can put that in the comment section as well. Hello, thank you for joining us from Miami. Nice to have you here. Hello, Massachusetts, that's where I am. All right, wonderful. Thank you all for joining us today for our presentation, Iceland and the Northern Lights. Now, for before we begin, I'd like to touch on a few housekeeping items. Um, during this webinar, we won't be able to see or hear you, but you will be able to see me, your host, and our guest. Um, but we would like to hear from you. So if you have questions for us, um, please feel free to put them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen on Zoom, or if you're joining us on Facebook, uh, you can put them in the comment section there as well. Uh, we will try to answer your questions throughout the webinar but uh, we also have a question and answer session at the end. We will try to get through uh, some more of your questions. Now, today we want to bring you with us on a virtual trip into the great outdoors where we will witness some of the most spectacular sights that our planet has to offer. Our travelers are drawn to Iceland because it is a place in which the power of nature can be viewed firsthand. We can witness raging waterfalls in the summer, extreme cold in the winter, and Iceland has a front row seat to the geologic power of the earth. And as we will see, Iceland is no stranger to earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Iceland is also one of the best places on the planet to view the Northern Lights. Today, we will discuss what causes this incredible phenomena, and more importantly, what one needs to do in order to catch them. Lastly, we will also be taking you around the Golden Circle uh, to explore the natural features that have made Iceland a top destination for travelers from around the world. But before we introduce our guest, we do want to let you know about some uh, recent developments from the travel world out of Iceland. Iceland has announced that it will be allowing vaccinated travelers to visit the country without completing a quarantine and testing period. With this information, we're excited to announce that we plan to run our spring departures. Now, we've spent a year preparing for this exciting moment, and we've taken every extra step to ensure that your Icelandic tour is as safe as possible. If you're already enrolled on one of these dates listed above, we will contact you around 45 days prior to your departure to confirm the details of your tour. Um, this development is recent though, so we may not be able to answer all of your questions during this webinar. And if you're interested in traveling to Iceland and have more questions, I would encourage you to call one of our tour consultants for more detailed information in the coming days. Now, 
our focus today was to be the Northern Lights, and we will be devoting most of our time to that. But at the end of our session, we will also be focusing on uh, the the, uh, the Golden Circle, which is included on every itinerary uh, that we have in Iceland. So if you're not already to sign up to travel to Iceland this year, I think you'll want to by the end of this session. So uh, start checking your calendars. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our guest for today. He has been guiding uh, go-ahead tour groups in Iceland for a number of years, but has also been helping visitors to Iceland explore there in a number of capacities. He served as a fishing guide. He is also a musician, a photographer, uh, and a motorbike enthusiast. Please say hello to my colleague and Fred, friend, Fred Johnson. Hello, everyone. Hi, Fred. How are you doing today? I cannot complain, although maybe some people would be because of the action that's been going on in nature, as you described, but we're <laughs> not worried over here. We're used well, to this. I should, I should say that you have graciously allowed me to call you Fred, which, which is not actually your first name. Um, would you do me the favor of, of telling the group what your first name is and, and what it means? Because I do think it's a, a sort of interesting story. Um, if I can pronounce it right, we'll see if I, that, if I manage that. <laughs> My real name is Frithjofur. Okay, Nielsen, show them what you've learned. All right, we, I've been practicing. Frithjofur. You see? Is that close? It, <laughs> you're, it's much better than most people. It's like fridge yogurt. So yeah. uh, I call myself Fred. But it's a warning that you get me as a guide because Frith. That first part of the name means peace. That's usually a good name for a guide. But the fjovur, the last part, means thief. So I'm a peace thief. I'm a troublemaker. And <laughs> you will have fun. You'll have fun with me. Yes, and, and we have had fun together. But uh, um, thank you for being uh, patient with me and uh, uh, putting up with my pronunciations. I was pretty close to fridge yogurt when we uh, when we first met. <laughs> I'm used to this. Uh, but, you know, I did want to talk a little bit about, as you mentioned, the recent volcanic activity that's been happening in Iceland. You know, mm -hmm. as we were preparing for this, we were talking about earthquakes. And, and then over the weekend, I started seeing these incredible pictures coming out. C can you mm -hmm. tell us a bit more about this eruption and and how this eruption compares to other ones that you've experienced in your, your life in Iceland. Okay, to start with, this is something we're very used to. This, on the average, in Iceland, we have a volcanic eruption every five years. This is the most volcanic active island in the world. And why is that? Because Iceland is being split in two by the tectonic plates or the continental drift. Uh, so we have the North American plate, and then we have the Eurasian plate, which is drifting apart. And in between, the crust of Earth is the thinnest. So sometimes we have eruption. Many times we have earthquakes, but this is daily bread for us. And so this, we call this a tourist puff here. And you can see people are just walking up to it. And yeah, that's, that's fine. We, we, you know, we'll be warm in the wintertime. No, it's actually, it, this is how safe we feel. And our scientists are the best in the world when it comes to volcanic eruption and earthquakes. So we know exactly what's going to happen, when it's going to happen. So do not worry. It may, okay, maybe you didn't know this, and I'll tell you in details later that James Bond is half Icelandic, shaken but not stirred, comes from here. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I'm glad to hear that that it, it's the eruption has finally happened because as we were talking, it sounded like you were having many uh, earthquakes throughout the day, and and I can imagine that that would be disruptive. But this or this uh, eruption, it sounds like, is not very disruptive to daily life at all. No, it's not uh, so far. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen, but what we've recently found out, what the scientists have found out, that, that this is an unusual one, although a small one because it's coming from the core of Earth. It's not coming from, uh, from anywhere sh shorter than that. So we haven't had this kind of lava come up in 10 million years or so. Wow. Well, you know, as I was talking about in the introduction, this is this goes to show Iceland is a place where you can really see um, the power of nature firsthand. Um, and with that, Let's dive into our topic, uh, 
you know, the, the Northern Lights, what we're here to discuss. So I know that lots of folks have, you know, an image in their head of what the Northern Lights look like, but they might not know what they are. And I would love it if we could get back to basics a little bit. And if you could describe what our scientific understanding of what are the Northern Lights? Okay, uh, rather than put my scientific glasses on and straighten my hair up and become, become scientific, I'm going to try to put it in layman terms, as I best understand it. And it's a very good thing that we have a volcanic eruption, because I'm going to apply that theory. Remember in 2010, when Eyjafjallajökull, which everybody knows how to pronounce, stopped of air... <laughs> stopped the air traffic for seven days because the ash rose as high as 30,000 feet. And mm -hmm. this was unhealthy for the props of the airplane. So we stopped air traffic. Now, this looks like smoke to begin with, but everybody found out that this is ash. And this ash is being pushed up from the heat within uh, the ground. And then gases pushed them as high uh, and as wide as the world. Sometimes it goes all around the world because the world keeps on turning while the ash comes up. So in this case, uh, these tiny little particles called ash uh, rises to the air. And as I told you before, every approximately every five years, we have a volcanic eruption. Similar things happen on the sun. Mm. So mm -hmm. cyclically, and periodically, there is what I would call an eruption. You could call a solar flare, or you can call it whatever you want. But let's call it uh, an eruption where ash comes out, but this ash looks different. It doesn't look black. These are tiny little pellets, which under a microscope would look like thin tin foil, about square centimeter each particle. And similar to the Eyjafjallajökull's uh, action, when it comes out of the heat, all these pellets, because of the friction of running against each other, because they're in the hot and the gases, they become magnetic and charged with electricity. So when the, um, the flares or the volcanic eruption happen on the sun, all these tiny little particles go up and they're sort of like gathered into one soap bubble. You can imagine all the ash in the forming picture just coming into one soap bubble and then start traveling into space. And then 36 to 48 hours later, this soap bubble full of um, magnetic pellets comes close to a magnetic field on Earth. So the magnetic field starts pulling this soap bubble towards Earth. It hits Earth and these little tiny pellets and the trillions are distributed all over the world. However, the magnetic field around the top and the bottom of Earth uh, sometimes starts up and starts gathering these pellets together into all kinds of shapes and basically like walls. They look like stripes, but they're actually walls. And you can see it on the furthest right picture that if you look furthest to the left of the on the Northern Lights, that it's a wall that rises up. And it rises from 175 kilometers to 400 kilometers high. And these are tiny little pellets, as I explained. And you expect to see those pellets? <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I, I would love to make a promise to you. But this is like fishing. Mm. Fishing, you know how many fish are in the river. You know the prediction of how many fish are. You know the weather report. You know everything, but yet it doesn't take. So sure, that's, sure. that's the fun of it. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of different aspects that go into this. There's there's the eruption on the sun. Then there's the whatever is happening with the magnetic field around the Earth. It, it sounds like it, it would be very difficult to predict this. Is there any... I assume people try, but is there any way to predict when one might be able to see the Northern Lights? Well, there are four basic elements that need to be in place. First of all, we need to uh, have some pallets coming from, from uh, the sun. And this we can measure by taking a picture of the sun and we see a black spot and you measure the size of the black spot. Hence, you can estimate how many of these particles may be traveling towards world through to the uh, to earth. 
uh, with some proximity. So they've made a scale that goes from zero to nine. And then if you have a five, then you need all other kinds of technical things for it to become uh, active. The next thing you need is a good weather forecast. Weather mm. is very hard to predict in Iceland because we're an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and the weather systems follow the Gulf Stream that warms up the coast here in Iceland. So we, with all the mountains and then the low pressure area and high pressure area from Greenland, the weather can change very fast. Oh, so sure. you, you need to be good in weather forecasting for you to just over over all just go out so you right need, you need, <laughs> even you just need to go clear, out in the dark yeah <laughs> yeah so you need a clear sky you need the pellets then you've got one basic problem that we're humans and our eyes are very not developed to see well in the dark especially our generation that's been living in urban communities where there's light all 24 hours our pupils just lose the uh, flexibility to uh, expand and subtract as we did before. I, I, I've always been trying to train my cat because the cat sees well in darkness <laughs> and I don't, but I don't understand what the cat says when I'm on these tours, but maybe I'll get that one day. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you for, for giving us that. Uh, I guess this is sort of like a baseline to start with our understanding of, of what the Northern Lights are. Um, what I'd love to do now is to sort of go back in time a bit um, and talk about the way that people in the past might have understood the Northern Lights, and then also talk a little bit about some some other folklore that uh, has come out of Iceland. But first, if you could talk about um, you know some of these myths that have come out of Nordic communities around what the Northern Lights are, um, I would love to hear that. Okay, uh, I'll try to make it simple. There's a lot of written facts about the Northern Lights, but here are some of the things that the Nordic people believed in the past. Until they knew that this was, in fact, coming from the sun, they believed that these were the warriors of the Viking era. Uh, in Game of Thrones, you may know them that they got to go to Valhalla and Odin would receive them as... Uh, accepted if they had been warriors, if they had uh, defended honor and their families was a strong chieftain, etc., etc. So people believed that this was life after death and the warriors were still fighting for their honor and preserving their heritage. Now, uh, this became a part of our culture with the, well, of course, I should say that the elves and the trolls, they do exist. <laughs> if there is ever a god, so do the elves. Now, sometimes the elves were called the hidden people, and here's a picture of them. They Ooh. can be they can Did you be take this photo yourself? Yes. Oh. I can I see them and I can take pictures of them. They post for me, only for me. So you want to be on the tour with me when we go up on the northern lights. But okay. Where did the myths come from and why? Well, mm -hmm. if, you, if you try to imagine Iceland only about 300 years ago, Iceland had no urban communities. There was only farms scattered around a country that's bigger than, that's four times bigger than Denmark. And there were only 50,000 people there. Okay, I might add that we're only 365,000 people here until you come and uh, increase that volume. So there's not too many people around. And at that time, there were maybe a day, daytime, um, a day's ride in between farms. Mm -hmm. So that's something in the dark, in the long winters, which uh, the winters are from middle of September to uh, April, middle of April, because in the summertime, it's, it's sunny or the sun doesn't come down. And in around Christmas, we have three hours of dusk. Wow. And so it's really dark. And that's one of the things you need for Northern Lights. So <laughs> that's <you> go. good. <laughs> you, you better have a hobby that fits that. But anyway, when in those old days, when the horse didn't come home or the horse was lost in the wintertime, 
who do you send out? You send out the old child. Let's put him at the age of 10 to 12. Mm. And he's told you're going to go out into this weather that we see now and those mountains and the lava fields. And it's scary. Mm. And you don't have a flashlight. You don't have any lights. So you're told if you do get lost, stay still. You go under a uh, sharp rock, which shelters you. And that's a lava rock because lava rock is sh sharp. And then you stay still, even though you start hearing voices, because the voices will sound something like this. <laughs> and then you'll start hearing them talking because you're 12 years old and you're afraid. Mm. So talk to the elves, stay still. And if you have something to give them, give them because they will repay the favor of getting you home. However, if you do get lost and you hear this, <laughs> and the earth starts trembling, those are the trolls. They are magnificently big and they only thrive in the dark. They cannot see the sunshine, but they will thrive out in the northern lights. Do run if you hear that. Why would they make these stories? Because the elves is something that you know the weather is going to change fast. So you're going to find your way home if you believe that you're safe where you're staying. However, if you hear the rumbling and the shaking, it's most likely an earthquake and the um, tectonic plates drifting apart like they usually do, or there's a, there's a volcanic eruption, which has been explained in the beginning here. So you tell children- <laughs> Definitely want to run, run away from that, yeah. <laughs> yes, you do not stay and you do not go close to the volcanoes like the people now in the COVID situation do. Right, well, well, back then, I guess they didn't have Instagram to be taking selfies. <laughs> <laughs> no, I suppose not. Um, Fred, I, I want to jump in here with, um, we did get a question that was submitted by both Linda and Mike. And um, the question is, what changes the colors of the Northern Lights and why are there different colors? Very good question. Um, the color, mostly you see green on the Northern Light pictures, but sometimes you see pink or red. Those are the magnetic pellets that are traveling, those that are green are traveling somewhere between 175 to 200 kilometers above us. And the red ones are the ones traveling the highest. Both are traveling in oxygen. Hmm. So if you see other colors like purple and other uh, colors, all colors are possible. Then you're basically seeing all the particle Part, uh, particles that are flying in between those two highest and the lowest, and they're traveling in different gases. Ah, okay. So it's the gases that these these pellets are traveling in that will create the different color effects. But the green is the most common. Yes, uh, it's a similar thing as in. Remember the plasma TVs we had. So it's an electronic charge that puts the, them glittering in different mm. colors. So it's the depth and the gases that are running through uh, the atmosphere that they're running through. But then when you have a flash where it's like, uh, sometimes happens very rarely, but I've experienced it a few times where there's a solar flare that really hits Earth straight. It doesn't go around the circle like we explained in the picture. Right. It, it hits straight. You can see all the colors and it's oh. usually... It doesn't stand for long, so it's maybe two, three, four, up to 15 minutes, and then everything goes haywire. And that's when you can see better than the camera, which I'll explain ah, later. Yes, yeah, we will get to that. Um, so one thing that was another question that we got when we, we asked for people for their questions when they registered for this event, and one of the most common questions, and you've touched on this briefly, but um, what is the best time of year to see uh, the Northern Lights uh, in Iceland? Uh, the easiest answer is uh, when it's dark. So it's the winter time in all Nordic uh, areas. And why is it the Nordic and the, basically the Southern, we have Southern Lights as well, but there are not as many people living under the magnetic field, which just happens to run straight in the middle of Iceland. 
So it's when darkness, we cannot see them in light. So we have long winters in the Nordic, uh, uh, which we can see them all the way from, well, we go on tours from mid September to mid April, basically. And it could happen any night. They're going on 24 seven, but you can only see them in the dark. Of course, of course. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. That's why, as you said, we we schedule our tours to be during those darkest months, because, of course, if you go during the summer, you wouldn't be able to see them. No, and you wouldn't meet the elves. <laughs> of course, the most important part of visiting Iceland. <laughs> I, I think they're the one that run the show. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> um, well, let's move on to the, the next section. And I should say that you know, some of these photos that we have been looking at, like of the elves and the trolls, these have been been your photos. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you are a photographer. And so um, you will um, go out and, and capture these. And one of the things that's fascinating about the Northern Lights is just how elusive they are, but also they're, they're difficult to photograph. Um, mm -hmm. Could you tell us a bit about how you go about finding the Northern Lights and also how do you go about capturing them on film? Okay, now I'm, gonna, now I'm going to give you the trade secret. <laughs> uh, the trade secret to finding them is actually using your di uh, digital uh, camera. The digital camera is the magnificent uh, Northern Light Finder. Remember I told you that these are tiny little pallets that are traveling 175 to 400 kilometers above you. Yes. So <laughs> do not have your camera on automatic because then the camera will start trying to focus on something we're trying to focus on the stars so you take a wide lens and you set the lens and the camera to manual and then you put the focus to infinity like you're trying to take a picture of one star then the camera has something we do not have in our eyes i can set the the pupil of the camera which is the f factor or the aperture I can set it as wide as I want if I got a good lens. So somewhere in the lowest uh, settings, you would have somewhere between 1.8 .8 to 4.5 or something. In, and you put it as low as possible, then you got an open pupil. Now, then you get the speed of the camera and the ISO, which you can set in modern cameras, you can set so low that it, if you open up the lens for 30 seconds with an open pupil, it records everything it resembles light or anything it sees in sure. the dark into one frame. Whereas our eye is only a split second that it's when you've trained your pupil to be expanded. And then you could put the ISO, the light sensitivity, very high. And this is how we find them. We basically take pictures out of the the window we jump out of the buses and leave people behind so they're saying where's the driver going where's the driver going but i'm just going to take a picture to try to find them because the camera distinguishes between regular clouds and a cloud of these pellets by turning the pellets green on the picture uh -huh. so so when you first are, are going out there and you're looking for the northern lights when you first get out there the, the northern lights can appear to look like a normal cloud to the naked eye but then with using a camera you can you can determine that they're actually green yes and that's how we find where they're coming from because they can come from any direction at any time they can last for a minute they can last for seconds they can last for hours that's the unpredictability is the magnetic field cannot be predicted it becomes active or non-active all of a sudden and that's the magic that's uh, when you catch the fish. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we actually just had a question submitted that was asking that how long does the Northern Lights, a Northern Lights incident ask? And the, and the short answer is it could be any period of time. There's nothing, it's a phenomenon. So don't expect anything, but have fun. Dress up, enjoy the ride. We'll take pictures of the stars. We may even see the Milky Way. We'll do some elf dancing. We'll talk to the elves. We may hear some music from the elves. I don't know. It's just fun. And then if we're lucky, you're not going to forget it. But then if you go with me, you're not going to forget it anyway. You've got a guy <laughs> called Peace Thief, a troublemaker, driving you up in the darkness and the cold. 
who's going to forget an event like that? Something for your grandchildren to talk about. <laughs> Um, so there, there was a question that we had, which was, um, do the Northern Lights have different shapes, or are they always the same shape? It, it, you mentioned before that they kind of come in in a, in a wall. Can you can you touch on that again? That's uh, there's no shape, there's no time, there's no colors, nothing to be predicted. But I can tell you that sometimes when it happens, people have been filled with expectation then when they see it it's yeah or people fall to the ground and start crying and said there's odin he's looking after me <laughs> it's you have all kinds of experience it just Wonderful. depends on your mindset yes yeah. don't, so ex you... don't expect anything just it, enjoy the ride the world is a ride <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you to Ariel for that question. Um, I do want to ask another one about photography, which I, I think that on the last slide you did have something about phones, but do you have tips for people that, that want to try to take pictures of the Northern Lights using a cell phone? Um, uh, is, is, this question is from Jerry. Is it possible to capture on a cell phone, if, especially if it has like a good camera? Uh, with the latest models of uh, Huawei, um, Samsung and uh, Apple, they do have so-called night settings, but it works in a little different way than the camera. But what you still need is you need to have a very still hand or a tripod with you because mm. what it does it with the phone, you leave it, you leave the um, lens open and it'll take three to five shots and layer one upon the other during those 12 seconds. So if one of them is moved, you'll see a slight movement. In sure. Uh, and you can also, this picture is, for example, taken on a GoPro 4, which should have been impossible, but it, everything's possible if you just, if, you, if, you, if you're like me, you're, yeah, I got to find out. I got to find out. How do I do it? You don't take no for an answer. <laughs> no, that's why my mother named me Frithjofer. <laughs> um, so, um, all right, let's let's uh, move on to. We just got another question, and this actually kind of dovetails nicely with uh, some of, with the next section, which was when you go out and you're looking for the Northern Lights in the middle of winter. How cold does it get? Well, Iceland really it's a moderately temperature country, and the reason why is because the Gulf Stream still has enough force to come around Iceland, so it keeps it moderately cold or warm. It really never gets really cold, and it really gets never it really never gets really warm. But when you have the wind factor and you've got the moisture in the air, and then you've got uneven and you don't have any shelter from trees or anything. And that's one of the reasons why Iceland is great for Northern Lights is we don't have any trees to bar our vision. We don't have to plant ourselves in one place to enjoy any direction, which other countries will have to. But it gets really, it feels really cold, cold mm. because of the wind and the, the uh, moisture factor. Sure, so, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. And and so um, that was one thing that we actually wanted to touch on during this presentation was how best to prepare for, for being in the outdoors. Because, um, oh, before we move on to that, I, I have to ask you about this photo. Now, this photo is one that, that, that you took, Fred. Um, and could you just tell us what we're looking at and how you found out what it was? Okay. Um I was out uh, not too far away from Reykjavik uh, and I had my Canon 5D, an old used camera, which I use for Northern Lights when I have uh, groups with me and I had taken pictures of everybody. There was snow on the ground and was uneven ground and I was sticking my uh, tripod down and I was shooting the first picture and I got a moved picture. It's a terrible picture because there's moisture in the, the lens, which puts point on them and it's moved unfocused and grainy. But something happened. Um, something came into the, into the lens and I did not know what it was. I had seen, um, 
a spaceship coming from uh, from Florida going up once, and we all found out that that was the same thing. So I thought this was a spaceship, maybe or a shuttle coming down from space, and I was just experiencing. So I put it on Facebook, and all went haywire. <laughs> Uh, all these astronomers start calling me. Did you see that? What was the color of it? How how was it? Did you hear it? Did you what color? Did you experience? How long did it take? And I had my lens open for about ten seconds, and this happened to in about the eight of those seconds. So if the Rolling Stones ever made a so song about the Northern Lights, which I think they must have made here, is you can't always get what you want. Then sometimes you might just get something like this. I didn't know what it was, but these scientists told me that this was a war star that had come into atmosphere. And I had no idea what a war star was. So what I said, is what is a war star? Uh, they told me to Google it. Let me come back <laughs> to that, Niels. <laughs> so I didn't know what I had. So three. Oh, two days later, he, the scientist calls me, can I keep this picture? Um, this is a war star that came in and it burned up, thank God, uh, about 300 kilometers where you took it and come from, came from this uh, part of space because in the color of your picture, we can see that it's made of blah, 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 blah. And I said, thank you, what's a war star? Google it. And so I went and Google it and a war star is something that's, it's a very tight, a uh, very strong kind of a rock that's a star, which basically if it hits another star, it'll explode the star or make an impression. So if this had been a fist sized thing that came into orbit and then came in and burned up, if the fist would have hit the ground, it would have felt like four Hiroshima bombs. Wow. So, well, I'm glad that it burned up too. <laughs> so in Iceland, we we just wait for earthquakes. Um, we have volcanic eruption, and then we have war stars. So wow. why don't you come here? Well, it goes to show that you know when you're out there and you're you're spending time looking at the night sky, you, you never know what you're going to see. And th uh, this is the magic of it. Even though we don't see the northern lights, we'll see shooting stars. We may see something like this, we may see the Milky Way, we may have just a whole lot of fun together. If just don't put your expectations up and we'll catch the pictures of them if they're out there, because I have a 97% hit rate on finding them. That does not mean I see it, but the camera does. Ah, ah I see. Um, well, wonderful. Let's let's talk a bit about preparing to go out on one of these adventures as we were uh, about um, packing tips. Can you give us just some, some real basics on how best to um, pack and prepare for traveling to Iceland, both in the wintertime and the summertime? Okay, the easiest thing is to think about when you're traveling here, You'll be traveling, especially if you're with EF or go ahead, you'll be traveling with the same bus everywhere. So the bus is your hotel away from your hotel. So, but you do dress uh, with wool next to your skin. Why? Because cotton kills. If you're hiking and you got cotton under there and you're, you're too warm, then you're sweat into the cotton, the cotton gets cold and you get hypothermia. That's something you do not want. So you dress wool next to your uh, body, summer or winter, unless it's really, really hot, which rarely happens. And then just have a thin wool, thicker wool, thin fleece, thicker fleece, and then either a raincoat or a dun jacket. And the same for your pants, you wear wool under your pants, unless it's just a warm day and you want to wear uh, shorts, but you have them in your bus because the weather will change and it changes every, okay. In Boston, when I was living there, they would sort of boast and said, you get <laughs> tired of the weather. You just wait 10 minutes here. We you do wait, say that. <laughs> we, here you wait two minutes. So we're the champions in time. Uh, so, so to the, the most basic thing is, is wear base layers layer up and and also wear sturdy shoes is that the, the main takeaway 
very sturdy shoes. You need to have hiking boots with you, preferably those that support your ankle. Mm. And you always have a hat and scarf and whatever you need to uh, dress for the rain and the wind, which will come sometime during your trip. And you will will go next to waterfall, so you better have a good raincoat and rain pants if you want to. If you really get the thrill out of going and experiencing it, just be prepared. It's wool, fleece, overcoat, hat, scarves, and sturdy shoes. Great, great. And I love that you mentioned waterfalls because I do want to get into some of the other sites that we we have in Iceland. Um, we do have three different itineraries with Go Ahead um, that you can you can experience Iceland. So the one that you would want to choose if you did want to see the Northern Lights is the Iceland Reykjavik and the Northern Lights, which we schedule to take place during the time of year when you would be able to view the Northern Lights, because as you mentioned in the summer, they're not you can't see them. Um, and then we have another six day tour, Iceland Reykjavik and the Golden Circle. And then we have a tour that is 10 days long, Iceland, the Golden Circle, and the Ring Road. And we wanted to take a few minutes today to talk about the Golden Circle because it is included in all three of these tours. Um, and the Golden Circle really connects three different sites that, that really you know, travelers from around the world come to see. Um, and I would love it if we could just talk through um, those different parts of um, the visit where you go around the Golden Circle. Okay. Now, the Golden Circle as such, it, it was just a marketing name that somebody found out and called it the Golden Circle because it ends on the Golden Waterfalls and marketer would say, yeah, we'll call it the Golden, Water Golden Circle. <laughs> but in my mind, it's more interesting to think of this as the gold running source for uh, survival in Iceland, i.e. water. Mm. We have so much fresh water. We have, uh, we have uh, hot water coming out of the ground in areas. We heat our houses 97% with hot water coming fr straight from the ground. Uh, all our electricity, we're actually utilizing 10% of our hydro and geothermal energy for ourselves. The rest is for industry, foreign and domestic. So we've got so much energy, we don't know how to do it. And here on the Golden Circle, we basically, in my mind and my tours, I sort of try to make it a concentration on a little bit of history and then tracing where the gold come from where the water comes from. This comes from the glaciers. And we'll see one of the glaciers. And basically, all these spots that we're going to visit are all coming from the same source. So the first place we visit is 40 minutes away from Reykjavik. And this is called Thingvellir, or the parliamentary plains. Those, that, those of you that have watched the Game of Thrones, this is the wall on the left. This is where they got the image of the wall. And this was what parted um, the worlds apart. And this is how it came about is what you're looking on, on, your, on your picture on your left is basically the, the end of the North, uh, North American, uh, what's it called? Uh, tectonic plate tectonic plates or the continental drift so north america is the wall and that's moving as on the other side of the valley we have the eurasian uh tectonic plates or continental drift and iceland's being split into every single second and we're just hap walking into no man's land there <laughs> Wow, it's really it's really beautiful. These walls, this wall that we're seeing here, is this also part of that that North American plate that you were you were mentioning? Yes, the one here on the right is the North Amer uh, American plate, and the 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 one on the left is the fallout from there into no man's land. So ah. there's the there you are basically walking from North America into no man's land. And if you travel with a car, it'll take you two minutes to go to Europe. So if you want to take a <laughs> short tour to Europe, you can do it there. 
<laughs> I love it. Wow. And, and this picture really shows you this this vast valley. It looks incredible. And and this you can see the water, as you talked about, that source of life there in, in the middle of this picture. Well, you can see the lake coming from the mountains. No, sorry, the river coming from the lake from the mountains. But you can't see on this picture the humongous lake that this river goes into. And it's the biggest, deepest, coolest, and clearest water in the world. So you might want to go there fishing, for example. Mm -hmm. there's, all, there's only five types of different trout that are uh, Antarctic. Uh, they're way before the ice, uh, ice age. Mm. So they've survived there. And it's a phenomenon. So this is a place of UNESCO's uh, places of heritage not only our historical site, but this is where the first parliament in the world was founded. And that the wall was basically the place they chose because the acoustics over there would travel uh. further for uh, more people to listen. But it was also f fresh food. So they only, they didn't have to take provisions on their few horses that they had. They could just fish here and then they could drink the water so they could survive for the two weeks every time they had this parliament. Ah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and then um, as we're traveling, the next stop would be Golfus Waterfall. Did I pronounce that right? Was I close? Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, you, well, we'll talk about that later about your sure. pronunciation. <laughs> okay, but it's could you tell us about the waterfall? It's called Gutfoss, and when you park the car, and maybe if you get good eyes in the back of the picture there, you can see tips of mountains be behind there. That's a part of the glacier where this water comes from, as well as the other lake, Lake Thingvellir is filled. But these are two major streams, uh, different streams. There are many streams coming from the same glacier, where the glacier melts from under, not from the top, because of the warmth inside the mm. mountain that the glacier lies on, the water comes seeping down and the, here it goes directly to the waterfalls. And here we've got a picture of four 40 foot containers of water coming down every second and have been since the foundation of Iceland or before, I don't know. So it's <laughs> formed a canyon here and it keeps on digging this canyon because the water keeps on going. This would be an obvious choice for uh, electronic plant for hydroelectricity, but a young woman saved these falls and they're now a um, national park and will not be disturbed because we love watching it. Oh yes, and then we love visiting it. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, and you, you yeah. love getting wet. You can see the <laughs> moisture going over there. Well, that, yeah, that's a good, a good point. You'd, for, for this visit, you'd wanna wear your rain slicker. You betcha. Wonderful. And and then, so the last site that we're going to be talking about is you also can view geysers on, mm -hmm. on the Golden Circle. Um, can you tell us about uh, what it's like to, to visit those? Uh, it's fantastic because, well, uh, it's the same, it's the same water, it's the water coming from the same glacier, only underground. And the magma or the core of earth, which is hot, is so close to the surface here that when that water comes uh, underneath the surface, it comes into such heat that it boils on 12 meters uh, depth. And then the pressure increases and we have a geyser every 10 minutes. So you're almost ah. guaranteed to see one. Well, that that's awesome because, you know, you know, when you go there, of course, you'd want to see one erupt. And it looks like in this picture here, these people would want to be wearing some rain slickers too. <laughs> these are the people that did not travel with me. This is what, I, this is when we all start laughing. Say, ha ha, they didn't listen to Fred. You're always on the right side of the geysers. It's just like, okay, for the guys in here, you know, we don't pee into the wind. It's going to go <laughs> over you. So here we just stay on the wind side with the wind to our back and it won't go over. You're not gonna, you're not gonna burn or anything because it's cool when it comes up, but it's wet. Yeah, <laughs> well, let's avoid that if we can. And then of course, you know, if, if it, the wind picks up, you don't wanna have uh, wet layers on. 
Uh, no, you, you don't want to be walking around in your wet clothes for long. No, no. Wonderful. Well, um, let's let's open it up for some questions and answers. I know that we've been getting some submitted and I would love to be able to put them to you. Um, one was just asking for some clarification on um, your use of the camera and the Northern Lights. Um, this question was um, from Kelly and it says, so it's much more likely to see with a camera only and not with the naked eye. Is that correct? Yes and no. It's, it's really hard to say. You will... Okay, here's how we do it, or I do it. I set the camera to extremes to try to find the green spots. Then I know what directions they're coming from. The picture is not great. I'll just see a green spot in there. But that's the, that's the place I'm, I'll be concentrating on them coming out. Then it's a matter of whether the clouds stay still, if it doesn't get cloud up, or if the magnetic field starts playing them. And there's all kinds of there's all kinds of things to learn to be okay to increase your possibilities of betting, but it takes weather, knowing the weather system, knowing the geography, knowing how the clouds are going to move, uh, seeing what the um, forecast is for these magnetic pallets. But I've been out in a seven where I saw nothing, but the camera saw a green sky. Mm. I've been out in zero where we were expecting nothing and it was a beautiful show. It was short, <laughs> but it was a beautiful show. It's all according to the magnetic field. Right. So I can't really answer that question really honestly. So it, with many things, it sort of depends, right? It, 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 it's sort of a chance. Just like fishing. Just like fishing. I like that analogy. I've been, I've been a fishing guide for, for 50 years. I, I couldn't tell you when the fish is going to take. That would be unfair. That wouldn't be fun because you, us humans, we would just take it in and say, okay, I've seen that. I got the fish. <laughs> yeah, I don't care. Yeah, done that. No, it's an experience. Great. Um, let's have uh, another question. This one's from Joseph. It says, if there are any uh, Northern Light displays expected during the tour, will a trip be organized to view the display? And will you be going along with the group to help direct documenting the display? Yes, the answer is yes. Um, on these tours, uh, we will, well, when I'm touring, I will be following all my projections and then I'll be following the bus companies to which are going and which are not going and I'll be spying all over the place what's what's happening and we'll run it according to that. I have taken a decision to delay things when I knew we weren't going to see it although some other companies were going mm -hmm. and I've also gone when other companies were not going because I had the belief we would find them. So. I will follow it and I will use all my technical data and all, and then sometimes EF will say, you, you got to go tonight. And then I'll just say, yes, I'm um, Another question from Carolyn. Are there any opportunities to see Icelandic ponies? Oh, yes. Ponies are all over the place. You'll see a whole lot of them. And if you're good, and I'm with you, I will take you to a special place where you get to meet them. And there's a challenge you have to take. You have to kiss the horse on the mouth. <laughs> I'm a troublemaker. I told yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> this we had another question actually about animals. This one's from Adriel. She says, "Are there any animals who only live in Iceland?" No. Uh, there there are animals that came from somewhere else, and the those would be the Arctic fox which can be found in other places. Um, and those, those um, ice age char or, mm. or trout. And, but that's, there's, we hardly have, we don't have him, for example, we don't have a very big bird life and we don't have a big uh, nature kind of flowers and things like that because of the, terrain so most of our birds are migrating except for a few but this is changing due to well i'd like to call it global warming 
we are getting new birds and we are getting new plants and we are getting something else. But one thing you should know is no mosquitoes, no snakes, oh. <laughs> no wolves, no predators, just mice and rats and whatever. But they're uh, more afraid of me than they, I am of them. Being from New England, I, I love the sound of no mosquitoes. That that uh, is really appealing to me. <laughs> um, let's ask another question. This one's from Althea, and this one is: um, Are there special woolen and fleeces manufactured and sold in Iceland? Not really anymore. Iceland used to have a brand name which was called Icelandic wool, but you can get you can get now what's the what's it called merino wool mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't irritate your skin as much so it's inner wool products from wherever but of sure. course the icelandic lamb is more insulated than other lamb in the world because of its uh it's traveling it's uh, it's free so it rambles free all over the country. And, and you could almost say that's one of our game is sheep. We, our sheep are, are naturally born and graced. Mm. All right, let's ask this one. Um, this one's from Janet and she says, if you wanna see the landscape, but you also wanna see the Northern Lights, how do you pick a time to go that would allow you to do both? That's easy, a long day. So you see the landscape, and you see the north, and you see the uh, golden circle. Then maybe you get dinner, and then we'll go for the northern lights. Sometimes that's how hectic it is, but it's really relaxing. I mean, we're not trying far. Uh, you don't have to stand out too long. So you've always got shelter. So it's easier than it sounds. But sometimes, you know, after a golden circle or a south coast, that's maybe the best shot for northern light so we'll just continue great and then we'll we'll find somewhere to eat in between it's unexpected uh, speaking of eating we got a question from perry and perry asks what types of food will we try oh what my experience is you'll try many uh, things which are all delicious this is something that has changed the most since i was a young child uh, we used to only eat fish, potatoes, and lamb. That's all we had. But mm -hmm. our cooks are now taking first places in all these magnificent uh, presentation of Icelandic and or imported food, but mostly Icelandic food, very healthy, all green, um, all salads, for example, are pest-free because it's cold and we grow them in greenhouses so we don't have bugs and things like that. So it's healthy, good food. And with, with the greenhouses, are those warmed by geothermal energy or is that unrelated? No, it's just a hole in the ground and you build a house around it. <laughs> I love it. Um, we have a few more questions that we're going to try to get to. Um, one of them asks, and I, I honestly don't know the answer to this. Um, if you go on a go-ahead tour, do you visit um, ice motels? No. No, okay. There's only one ice motel, I think, I'm correct, is in Sweden. Uh, you will, however, on the... On the six day tour, we will go into an ice cave. Oh, okay. And that's very interesting. If you're into geology and myth, it is fabulous. You're going into the core of Earth. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I, I would love to hear uh, just a touch more about the ice cave. Okay, there's a lot of ice caves in Iceland. Why? Because what I explained, the warmth of inside the mountains uh, melts the snow or the ice from within. So that means with melting, for example, in the springtime or summertime, there will be more leakage from under. So it'll create a canyon inside the cave. These are not all safe. So what they did was they drilled into Langjökull, which we talked about before, where the source of uh, water is. 
they drilled um, a cycle inside the, the, uh, inside the glacier. So you walk into the glacier and you take a tour and you try your voice in the echo and you see the, the streams coming around. You see just you're looking into history about maybe 3000 years ago. You're walking inside history and you're touching the DNA from year 1000 or something. And if you use your imagination, just being able to walk into a concept like a glacier and think about the layers of sand that you're seeing, that was layers of lavic ash in year one, 100, 200, 500. It's just, it's hard to explain. It sounds like, yeah, ice cubes are nice. <laughs> but oh. it's an experience. Wow. I, I really found it thrilling. I thought I would be bored to death. What? Walking into a glacier? But with these guides and the people that are around that, it is a phenomenal experience. That sounds great. We, we only have time for one more question. Um, and this question is, uh, will we visit, on Go Ahead Tours, will we visit the Blue Lagoons? Yes. Wonderful. Need I say more? Well, <laughs> let's put it this way. If the volcanic eruption at the moment continues, you will not, because it's very close to the Blue Lagoon. In fact, they were expecting it to come up in the Blue Lagoon, but I see no reason why that shouldn't be. Sure, sure. And All right. Well, if, if, if things remain as they are, then, then it would be included. Yeah. Yes. Oh, definitely. <laughs> it's... It's a major thing. If if we don't find that, we'll just find another way to get into the hot water. And personally, you know, we the biggest national sport, which is never presented, is swimming outdoors in Iceland because ah. we have all the hot water. So we s swim in 27 degrees Celsius water all year round. And then you get the hot tubs. These are public pools, but they're like five star uh, spas. So don't, oh. don't miss those when you come. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you so much, Fred, for answering our questions and for uh, talking us through your wonderful country, the, uh, Iceland and the Northern Lights. So we do want to put a, uh, a note out here to remind you about our upcoming travel talks. Next Tuesday, we're going to be talking about Japan with tea culture and cherry blossoms. Then the Tuesday after that, on April 6th, we'll be talking about Italy food and wine tours. On Earth Day, April 20th, we'll be doing a destination spotlight on Costa Rica. Uh, and then on Thursday, April 27th, we will be doing ancient Egypt with an Egyptologist. And then on May 11th, we will be doing a destination spotlight on Scotland, castles, whiskey, and traditions. We do want to remind you that uh, at this stage, Iceland has uh, reopened for vaccinated travelers, and we would encourage you to call in and talk to our tour consultants if you do have questions about the tour that you are booked on or if you are interested in enrolling. Um, we imagine that these spots will go very quickly, so we would encourage you to call as soon as possible. Uh, thank you again for joining us for this presentation on Iceland and the Northern Lights. And thank you again, Fred. We really appreciate you joining us, and we hope that you have a lovely evening. Thank, thank you, you all. You. Thank you all. Thank you so much. I, I look forward to seeing you in person. Look Wonderful. Me I'm, only, <laughs> I'm one of the 365,000 people. It's no hard finding. <laughs> thank you, Fred, and thank you all for joining us. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you.